All right, thank you very much to Dr. Yates. And so, as some of you may know, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to circadian biology, and specifically to three circadian biologists or chronobiologists for discovering the circadian clock mechanism. And so what this is, is a tiny molecular clock mechanism that's present in all of our cells. And what we do in my lab is apply circadian biology to medicine. And so the title of today's talk is Mess With Your Body Clock, Pay With Your Heart Health. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, so this is an overview of today's talk. I'm going to begin with an introduction to what circadian rhythms are, talk about our focus of research, which is disturbing rhythms or circadian desynchrony, benefits of applying this to treat heart disease in two areas, chronotherapy or timing of therapy, and intensive care units, and then with the last few moments, talk a little bit about some of our new initiatives in areas of veterinary medicine and food industry. Okay, so by way of introduction, and just reading off the slide here, circadian rhythms and their cognate clockwork mechanisms are part of our genetic heritage that we carry in, in evolution. Does this work better? Yeah. Okay, oh, I'm stuck to here though. Okay, and the reason why we have these is because we're living organisms and we survive on a planet with a 24 hour day and night cycle. So essentially these help us to adapt to light and dark know when to be active and when to rest, when to be asleep, and when to be awake. The importance of the field is widely recognized even before the Nobel Prize, and the reason why is because it applies to virtually every organism on Earth. And so these clock mechanisms have been described in pretty much every journal there is out there, including those highest covers that you can see here. So our group is internationally recognized for applying circadian biology to benefit health. And the way we do it is on this slide. So really it's the intersection of these three areas. So what we do is we study circadian rhythms. We're interested in how they apply to health and disease. And specifically we're interested in the major cause of death, which is cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to do one slide on how circadian rhythms work and then move on to sort of what happens in humans. So basically what they are is they're a connection between the outside world, the environment, your brain, and your body. Okay? And so what happens, you can see on the, on the slide here, is that the presence or absence of light is detected by dedicated cells in your eyes. And these transmit a signal to a region of your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN, in the hypothalamus. And in this region of the brain, there's this little clock mechanism that runs, and essentially what happens is it takes 24 hours to go once through its loop, and so that's how it keeps time. Okay? And this is called the master clock, and then it's gonna send messages out to the rest of your body, to the areas that don't see light. So it'll send out messages to the heart, or the liver, or even other areas of your brain in order to tell them how to keep time. Okay, and these rhythms are really important for our health. So this is two classic examples for cardiovascular health on this slide here. So on uh, the left side, we've got heart rate. So you've got your heart rate, human heart rate on the left, 24 hour time of day on the right, and we have this nice circadian rhythm or like a cosine wave in our heart rate. Heart rate is lowest when we're sleeping. It's up during the day and down again at night. Similarly, we have a rhythm in our blood pressure. So blood pressure is on the Y, and again, 24 hour time a day on the X. And you've got this nice circadian rhythm or cosine wave. Our blood pressure is down when we're sleeping, up during the day, down again at night, and these parallel the sympathetic and parasympathetic biases of our autonomic nervous system. Our endocrine system also cycles. Lots and lots of hormone cycle, including those relevant to the cardiovascular system. And the ones we'll classically study in heart research would be your catecholamines, your cortisol, and melatonin. And rhythms are important not just for healthy cardiovascular physiology, but they also play a role in disease as well. So for example, 
in the timing of onset of acute cardiovascular events like heart attacks. So what do I mean? Just reading off the slide here. A myocardial infarction or an MI or heart attack occurs when a clot or plaque blocks a blood vessel and then the tissue downstream doesn't get blood and so it dies. So if this is your heart, you get an occluded coronary artery here. This is your area of infarct or heart attack. And there's a timing to these happening. There's a time of day when people are more likely to come into emergency wards with heart attacks. So a classic uh, study by Mueller in New England Journal of Medicine. He's plotted infarcts per hour here. How many people come into the emergency ward? And what time of day they come in? And again, you see this nice circadian rhythm showing that heart attacks are most likely to occur between about 6 a.m. and noon compared to any other time of day or night. And there's rhythms in all kinds of different aspects of heart disease. We don't have time to go into them all, but I listed some on this slide. So timing of onset of heart attacks or MIs, ventricular tachyarrhythmias or abnormal heartbeats, sudden cardiac death, high blood pressure or hypertension, dissection or rupture of aortic aneurysms, and even time of day likelihood of whether you're going to die from coronary uh, procedures. So mortality with percutaneous coronary interventions or angioplasty. The key take home message is that our bodies are remarkably different in the day as compared to the night. Who we are physiologically in this room at lunchtime is very different than who we are physiologically when we're in our beds at night. And the reason why is to ensure that processes occur at an optimal time of day or night because obviously you need to bring different things to your day game than you need to when you're sleeping. Or there's a quote by Albert Einstein that I like that I think really summarizes it. The only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen all at once. You guys are tough today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so our group, we tend to think of ourselves as molecular biologists, and we do a lot of molecular biology showing that the molecular biology underlies these rhythms and it cycles day and night, and you're just gonna have to take my word for it. Basically, it sort of controls our physiology, and what I wanna talk about specifically today is if these rhythms are important for our health, then what happens when we disturb them? Because disturbing these rhythms is going to have physiologic consequences. So we're going to talk about what happens when we disturb rhythms. It's a picture of Salvador Dali's clock explosion. And it's just here to emphasize the point that cellular time is important. So why do we care about rhythm disturbance? Well, up to 25% of our population <coughs> engages in shift work at some point in their working career. The World Health Organization has gone so far as to call shift work a risk factor for coronary heart disease, sudden cardiac death, breast cancer, obesity, and type 2 diabetes, all by turning, changing when we turn the lights on and off. Some other examples are on this slide here. What happens when we disturb rhythms? We do it with sleep disorders, which are prevalent in our society, whether they be, for example, behaviorally induced, the result of chronic pain, or more classically, people will study sleep apnea, which is snoring and disordered breathing at night, and you wear these masks called CPAP therapy in order to restore breathing. So we know that rhythm disturbances and shift work cause health problems. But what we don't know is how it contributes to our major cause of death, which is cardiovascular disease. And so in the spirit of it being Halloween soon, if you are a vampire or a zombie, this does not apply. But for the rest of us, heart disease has reached epidemic proportions. This is a map of CDC data across the United States with a sweep of heart disease death rates. Overall, it affects an estimated one in three adults in North America. So if you look to your left, and you look to your right and include yourself, that's one in three. Cost the Canadian economy more than 20.9. What's that, Coral? <laughs> Coral's that. No, we're just picking. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's ducking. <laughs> you can't all duck. 
Uh, it costs the Canadian economy more than $20.9 billion each year in hospital services, lost wages, and decreased productivity. So it's a huge economic and increasing economic burden. And part of the reason why is because our population is aging. So in 1900, about 5% of our population was more than 65 years of age. And now we're up around 20% of the population. So we study heart disease, and these are the main types of heart disease, and what we study is the biggest type of heart disease there is, coronary heart disease. And so we study it across the whole continuum. So we look at the risk factors, which are things like metabolism and obesity. We look at the heart disease itself, and especially heart attacks. We look at the heart and the blood vessels. And we look at how it progresses towards end stage, towards heart failure, and we use lots of techniques at the molecular and the pathophysiologic level. What we know from a cardiovascular perspective in humans is that rhythm disturbance and shift work are associated with an increased risk of you getting heart disease, of adverse cardiovascular events like sudden cardiac death or heart attacks, and if you already have heart disease and you shift work, you're going to have worse outcome. So what my group does is we look at this experimentally and we try to understand why this happens. And we use a bunch of different experimental models. So for example, we alter the light-dark environment. We invented this model called 10-10 desynchrony, which is 10 hours of light and 10 hours of dark. We sort of shift work animals. We built these, I'll show you again later, but these circadian rhythm cabinets, which are in the central animal facilities where we can control the light-dark cycles and change them to whatever we want. We use genetic approaches, so over in the central animal facilities as well, we have lots of different strains of genetic mutant, circadian mutant mice. And then we use drugs or pharmacology. There's these new small molecule inhibitors that target specific uh, parts of the clock mechanism, and we'll study them. So over the years, we've done lots of different experiments looking at rhythm disturbance and cardiovascular disease experimentally. And each of these could be their own study, but what I'm going to do today is just kind of summarize the key point. So we had mice with heart disease, and we shift worked them, and they did worse. We had genetic tau hamsters, so their internal clock mechanism runs at a different speed than the outside world, and they developed heart disease. Heart attacks in the day as compared to the night set off different molecular pathways. And most recently, we were messing with the molecules themselves. So in this study, we messed with a molecule called CLOCK, and it accelerated cardiac aging. But it doesn't really matter which way you do it, because it always recapitulates the same idea, which is that if you disturb rhythms, you're going to do worse. So a few years ago, I was giving a talk at Clinical Grand Rounds, and I was very excited because I was doing all these different models, and you know, I was getting lots of data and showing all the data to people, and a clinician interrupted me, put up his hand and he interrupted me, and he said, Tammy, it's all well and good that you have lots of data and you're excited, but we don't really care. We don't care what happens when you disturb rhythms. What we want to know is what we can do with this information in order to help our patients. And so this was kind of a paradigm shift for me. And I started to look at my research not so much about disturbing rhythms, but more about how we could use this information to benefit health. So with the next section, I'm going to talk about two different ways that we've started to do this. The first way is this idea called chronotherapy, or timing of therapy. And we did this study, along with Dr. Jeremy Simpson, who's in the back there called Sleep Time ACE Inhibitor Therapy Benefits Heart Disease. And so basically we gave these ACE inhibitors. Why ACE inhibitors? Because they're widely prescribed. They're the drug class most often given to humans who have had a heart attack or who have high blood pressure. And the way they work is they target something called RAS, or the renin angiotensin system. So it's a major system in your body, and it has a circadian rhythm to it. And so the basic idea behind this study is that if you give your ACE inhibitors when RAS is high, it's going to be much more effective than if you give your medications at a time of day when it's low. So you can see some of the results here. So ACE inhibitor treatment during sleep, but not wake time, produced better outcomes. So this is a normal mouse heart. This is with heart disease. You can see it's bigger. 
Give the drug at wake time, it's still pretty big. Give it at sleep time, it's much smaller. In fact, almost as if there's no heart disease at all. And this captured lots of media attention around the world. There's a couple of covers here from the National Post and the Globe and Mail. Your heart medication is more effective at bedtime. But there's a problem with studies like this, and there's a problem with rodent studies in general that the people who do mouse research don't tell you. And that's that it's virtually impossible to convince people, and especially clinicians, to change their practice based on you causing and curing heart disease in a mouse. If the mice take over, we're totally there. But otherwise, they won't change for people. There's another reason, and this is a problem with circadian biology that the circadian biologists don't tell you, which is that mice are nocturnal, so they're up at nighttime, and humans are diurnal, so they're up in the daytime. So you don't really know if those treatments or pathways that you're looking at relate to night or day, dark or light, wake or sleep, because they're kind of mixed up. So what we did in order to address this at the University of Guelph is we created the Preclinical Translation Center, which is the only one of, it, of its kind in the world for circadian biology. And it lets us take these basic studies forward from our model systems towards humans. And it works like this. So we have our basic research mouse models. Whether, to, regardless of which approach we use, we use our genetic approaches, our pharmacologic approaches, our environmental approaches. So for example, these ACE inhibitors or other studies. The ones that work, we take our most promising circadian strategies forward to preclinical testing. And the way we do that is we developed a porcine or pig heart model. And we use classic human catheterization techniques. And why do we use pigs? Because their hearts are similar to humans. And they're also diurnal animals, just like us. And importantly, we can do the same diagnostic state-of-the-art imaging as you use for humans. So we have cardiac MRI and echocardiography. So if our treatments work, we can then go to the clinicians with the same type of data that they're used to seeing and show them that it works so we can move things forward to clinical trials. So this is the MRI that we use for animal clients. And this is Alice here. And we added cardiac sequences to be able to do the heart. We also do echocardiography. We do lots in our animal models, but then primarily with the help of Dr. Lynn O'Sullivan and her team here, we're able to adapt it to larger animals. So the take-home message is that timing of drug therapy matters, and the reason why is because you're targeting the products of these rhythmic circadian rhythm genes. So a couple of years after we published that, a colleague of mine in the States, John Hoganosh, uh, put another paper out in PNES where he said it's not just the heart medications that do this, but virtually all medications do this. So just reading off the slide here, he said, the majority of best-selling drugs and World Health Organization essential medicines directly target the products of rhythmic genes. Many of these uh, drugs have short half-lives and can benefit from time dosage. So just looking at the heart for the moment, if you have high blood pressure, there are studies showing that it might be better to take your blood pressure medications at night, at least for your heart. At a high risk of heart attack, it might be better to take your aspirin at night as compared to the day, because it might better protect your heart. And classically, sleep apnea, disordered breathing at night, you're going to treat this with a nighttime therapy called CPAP, and it protects your brain, your body, and your heart. So cardiology, cardiologists are a fairly conservative uh, profession, and it's taken a while to really be able to reach out. And so we were especially excited when in 2015, the Canadian Journal of Cardiology not only asked us for a review on circadian effects in the cardiovascular system, but also featured our research on the cover. And the next year in 2016, the American Heart Association, which is the leading American cardiovascular journal, wrote a story about our research and some others on how the heart's circadian rhythms point to potential treatment strategies. And I'm just going to quote myself here. Okay, I said, we've known for the last couple of decades about the importance of circadian physiology for heart health at Tammy Martino Center for Cardiovascular Investigations at the University of Guelph in Canada. But 
Clinical cardiology didn't really pay attention to how you could apply it to benefit the treatment of patients. So at least in terms of timing of treatment or chronotherapy, you don't even have to invent new drugs. Using ones that have long therapeutic experience by timing them to the body's physiologic and molecular rhythms, you can improve efficacy, reduce toxicity, and benefit patients. Okay, second way we use this to benefit health has to do with intensive care units and goes to the idea that's written on this slide, and I'm just going to read it. And that is that modern hospitals, particularly in intensive and coronary care units, they still use multi-bedded rooms. Contemporary medicine ignores the importance of undisturbed dynamo rhythms, even in our critically ill. And so these are just pictures off the internet, but they show you the idea that there's frequent patient-staff interactions, the lights are on at night, there's a lot of noise. And we asked a simple question, we said, well, if somebody has a heart attack, they call an ambulance, and they get brought into this environment, is that going to have an adverse effect on the healing of their heart? And what we found, at least experimentally, was that yes, it does. So here's the study we did, short-term disruption of diurnal rhythms post-MI worsens outcome. And so it's just briefly put on this slide. So we used what's called the murine left anterior descending coronary artery ligation model or heart attack model. Animals are infarcted in a two-hour time window, monitored to the end of their life cycle, and then randomized into one of two groups. Either they're put in a normal light dark cycle, 12-hour light, 12-hour dark, or they're disrupted just for the first five days, and then they go to normal light dark. And so here's how we did it. This is Elena. She was a PhD student in my lab, and she did the surgeries. So if this is your heart, or the mouse heart, you would do an infarct here. The animals then go back in their cages, and they sit in our circadian rhythms cabinets in the central animal facilities where we can alter the light-dark cycle to whatever we want. So all the infarcts start the same. doesn't matter which group they go to. But this short-term disruption, just for the first five days, worsens outcome two months later. And you can even see it visually here. So if you take a mouse heart and put it in a matrix and section at one millimeter, you'll get six sections. After a heart attack, you get more sections because the heart is bigger and you've got these scar areas or infarcts. Okay? And in the disrupted group, hearts are bigger still and you have bigger scars. And we did it lots of different ways. You can see some of the functional data at the bottom for echocardiography. So, uh, for example, percent ejection fraction, how well the hearts are pumping. Normal value for a mouse is 81. After MI, it goes to 60. Disrupted, it's down to 45 and heading towards heart failure. And what's amazing is that you don't even have to wait months later to see the adverse effects. You can see it within one week after MI. And so this is Faisal Alibi, another PhD student in my lab, and most of the data you're seeing in this section he did. So he's measuring lots of different parameters of the heart. This is just one of the parameters here, and days after MI. And what you need to know is that this is the value for a normal mouse heart. With MI, with a heart attack, it's bigger. In the disrupted group, it's bigger still, and you can see a difference by just day seven. So we asked ourselves, we said, what is it that changes in this early remodeling period that has such a profound effect later on? And we drew this cartoon sketch of cardiac remodeling. So in phase one, you have immune cells come into the heart to clear away the debris, then a proliferative phase, and then scar maturation. And so we focused our attention first on the inflammatory phase when the light-dark cycle is altered. We first PCR'd for cytokines in the heart, so disrupted are black and normal are white, and you can you know, just see a difference here. So uh, cytokines are up, like interleukin-6, MCP-1, and MCP-3. And since cytokines call immune cells in, we then looked at the immune cells in the heart. And so the first ones that come in are the neutrophils. This is a cartoon picture of a neutrophil. And one of the cool things about neutrophils is they have these little enzymes inside called myeloperoxidase. And so an easy biochemical assay you can do is just grind up all the heart tissue, quantify the myeloperoxidase, and it gives you a surrogate indicator of how many neutrophils came into the heart. And so this is our MPO assay here. You can see MPO on the Y, days after MI on the X. And normally what happens is the black line. 
So you can see neutrophils come in and peak around day two and then leave. But when the light dark cycle is disrupted in our ICUs, you can see they don't come in as quickly and they persist later on. And we did it lots of different ways, including immunohistochemistry. So again, we see the neutrophils are not right. And then the cells that they call in after them, the macrophages are not light, uh, right. It's kind of like a domino effect. And if you don't set the stage properly for healing, then the healing just continues to get worse. So that's why by phase two, when you're back in a normal light dark cycle, you're still getting worse healing. So this is a new blood vessel formation or angiogenesis. You can just see on the, si on the side here. You don't get as much new blood vessel formation in the damaged area in the disrupted versus the normal mice. And finally, that's why in phase three, you get worse infarcts. So infarct expansion is up in the disrupted compared to the normal group. And you can even see it visually here. There's bigger infarcts. And not only are they bigger, they don't have the same integrity. They're not as thick. So infarct thickness is down in disrupted compared to normal hearts. But we're not just interested in whether change in the light-dark environment is going to make things worse. We want to know how this specifically relates to the circadian clock mechanism. So we did one more experiment. We asked the question on here, can the circadian mechanism and specifically molecules like clock influence how immune cells are called in to the damaged area? And the answer we found is yes. So we have our uh, wild type mice. We have our circadian mutant clock mice that we got from our collaborators in the States. And we show when we give heart attacks, they have different ways of calling in the neutrophils and the macrophages. So to summarize, we found the circadian mechanism plays a role in modulating immune responses crucial for early scar formation. And if you disrupt, it's going to disrupt healing all the way along the continuum. And this we published recently in Circulation Research. It was the subject of a number of editorial reviews, the first of which I especially liked because I thought it really made the point, which is how can I recover if you won't let me sleep in science? And anyone who's ever been in a hospital has probably experienced this. The second is myocardial repair occurs around the clock. And this one had a quote in it that I especially liked. It was attributed to Eugene Brunwald, who's considered a pioneer in cardiology. And he said, and just reading off the slide, as an intern in 1952, we admitted patients with acute MI or heart attacks wherever a bed was available on the medical service, but always as far from the nurse's station as possible. So they would not be disturbed by the commotion, especially the frequent telephone ringing. So even before we knew what circadian rhythms were, we knew not to disturb them, but there wasn't much we could do because the first description of a cardiac care unit wasn't until 1961, and I know some people think that was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. The first CCU was, it wasn't even uh, here. It was until 1965, and it was located in the Toronto General Hospital. So we created these environments where we could start to uh, bring in critical resources for patients, but in doing so, continue to disturb circadian rhythms and sleep. So how do you translate these findings? Because they're not pharmaceutical. One way is in the design of new hospitals. And consideration is given into how ICUs are built. And this is just a picture off the internet that shows you some of the ways they do it. For existing ICUs, there are some procedures that can be considered. You can bring computers behind screens. You can bring catheters behind screens. You can think a little bit about nursing shift rotations and timing of treatment. And it's something we've talked a little bit about with uh, investigators at Toronto General. And most recently, what we've started to do is work with these new, what I call circadian medicine drugs. They target specific molecules in the clock. And we found that if we give them in these uh, first few days, we hold the clock constant in these first few days, they appear, at least to me, we have yet to convince reviewers, but they appear to me to cure heart attacks. And so this evolving scar, which you see here in a ischemia reperfusion model, is completely gone. And this is work I'm doing with a PhD student, Christine Reitz, in my lab. So take home message is that short-term disruption of diurnal rhythms after MI worsens outcome. But if we reconsider how we maintain biorhythms in acute critical care settings, if we change the way we practice medicine, this can benefit repair mechanisms and significantly benefit patients.
And so the research, again, has attracted lots of media attention. The Heart and Stroke website features our research on, uh, on the website about how circadian rhythms affect heart attack recovery. Science recently did a special section on circadian physiology where they talked about the basic biology and alluded to the idea that someday this could help for medicine. And so I wrote an e-letter that they published along with my colleague in the States, Martin Young, called Circadian Medicine, where we talked about how we and others are already doing this, especially in relation to cardiology. And most recently, as Charlotte mentioned, we did a little bit of work on circadian clock and how that's different in men and women, and it's a paradigm shift for understanding and treating heart disease, and it was CBC News, Women and Heart Disease, Female Hormones Protect Against Heart Damage from Body Clock Disruptions, and I think Elena Claris is here somewhere too, and some other people who worked on this uh, with us. But I don't want to talk about this because Glenn's going to talk a whole lot more about uh, biological sex and heart disease in a moment. And so what we're going to do is shift direction slightly and talk about animals. And with the last couple of minutes, specifically new initiatives to benefit veterinary medicine and food industry. Okay, so humans go to ICUs, animals go to ICUs as well. This is a picture of the ICU over here at the OBC. And they struggle with the same issues, and there's good reasons why. But the lights are on, there's noise at night, there's frequent patient-staff interactions. And so one of the things we started to do is put together teams, especially with Lee and Alexa, to see if we can go in there and look at at least some of the practices related to light, and if there's a way to be able sort of to improve the welfare of the animals. Humans get put on ACE inhibitors for heart disease. Dogs and cats do as well. Dobermans, for example, about 50% of the breed develops profound dilated cardiomyopathy because of an unknown gene mutation, and guess what? They get put on ACE inhibitors. So one of the things we're starting to look at is maybe we should think about when the animals get their ACE inhibitors, or at least whether nighttime coverage is important, and this is work that's being done with the preclinical translation, and also uh, especially with Dr. Lynn O'Sullivan and her team uh, at OVC and some others. And finally, the latest thing we started doing is circadian and food production, the broiler or the meat chickens, or what I affectionately refer to as our Swiss chalet chickens. You can see from the picture here, our chickens are getting bigger over the decades. And part of the reason why is because the lights are on virtually 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if they turn the lights off, the animals go to sleep, and they don't eat as much. If they leave the lights on, the animals will eat more, and then they'll be bigger when it's time to process but they develop heart problems. And as we saw from the earlier studies, you mess with the light-dark cycle, you're gonna mess with the immune system. You mess with your immune system, you're gonna be more susceptible to infectious disease, and maybe you're gonna be using more antibiotics, which is not where contemporary food production wants to go. So the idea is to start to work on creating different balances, being able to alter light, so that you can still have this growth but healthier immune systems for the welfare of the animals, maybe decrease antibiotic use while still maintaining commercial productivity that the farmers need. And again, working on teams of people with this, and especially Ron Johnson, and we went over to Arkell Farms a couple of weeks ago and looked at the poultry facilities as a place to maybe start to uh, do some of this work. So thanks to our many collaborators across the University of Guelph, Canada, and around the world, sources of funding, and none of this would be possible without the students in the Martino Lab, and so all the ones you see here were involved in or are currently involved in the research that I talked about today. Thank you.